Welcome back to the 16th episode of our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid, where we talk to researchers previously funded by Australian Rotary Health about their research findings. I'm Jessica Cooper, and today we'll be talking to Dr. Simon Wilsch from Flinders University. Dr. Wilsch was part of of Associate Professor Susan Burns' research team, who were awarded a mental health research grant from 2017 to 2018 called a randomised controlled trial of an efficacious school-based eating disorder risk reduction program, a comparison of two, four and eight lessons. He's also working on another ARH grant with Professor Tracy Wade called Expanding the Reach and Delivery of Media Smart Targeted, an online intervention. Dr. Wilsch is both a researcher and clinician in the area of eating disorders. He is a senior research fellow leading research projects in the area of eating disorder risk factors, prevention, early early intervention, and improving treatment experience and outcomes for patients and their families. So thank you very much, Simon, for joining us on today's podcast episode. Uh, How's everything been going for you lately? Hi, Jessica. Good to be with you. Um, Excuse me. Um, Things have been very busy for me lately. As you mentioned there, I'm both a researcher and a clinician. And so my my practice provides treatment to children, adolescents and adults experiencing eating disorders. And so, of course, during the time of COVID, there's been adjustments to telehealth and online services and and then back to -to face-to-face. And, you know, times of uncertainty are, are difficult for everyone, but particularly those experiencing mental health symptoms. So there's... There's been a lot to work through and of course uh, the research angle um, there's implications as well with the with the lockdown procedures so there's been a bit to juggle but holding up okay all things considered thanks yeah and and so you mentioned that you see um clients with eating disorders is it particularly hard for them at the moment as well with covid it's been an interesting um experience to see how people have reacted there have been Somewhere that this period of real sort of um, heightened anxiety and so on has definitely made it harder for them. No question about that. And there's been others where they've almost had the experience of, well, there's so little in my control at the moment that I might as well um, <clears throat> kind of take charge of what I can take charge of, which in this case is, is their recovery. And some have done almost better than expected during this period. They've fought really hard to make progress with their recovery. So um, a very interesting mix out there, yeah. Mm. Yeah, um, and so you've been working on two projects funded by Australian Rotary Health um, relating to eating disorders and and just recently finished one of them, um, which was a a school-based eating disorder program. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about this program and and why you decided to target schools um, specifically? Absolutely. So, so the program is called Media Smart, and I first developed that during my PhD with Tracy Wade, which I completed in 2007. So, Media Smart, <clears throat> it, it's really targeted at young adolescent girls and boys. Um, so, often year sevens and year eights are the main target audience. And uh, basically, Media Smart targets a risk factor for eating disorders called media internalization, and that that's a a phrase we use to describe when young people feel like they should look like these images of beauty that they see in the media. So typically for women that is and girls, that's usually a thin ideal. For boys, um, historically, we've thought of that as a muscular ideal, although for some boys and men now, it is also a thin ideal. Um, and so Media Smart um, really sort of seeks to educate young people about how um, the media creates the sort of messaging that they do, the different tricks that go on when um, images are being produced, and then of course airbrushing and digital editing afterwards. It also looks at um, the kind of pressures that are placed on young people more broadly and and what they can do about those pressures, building up skills to be resilient against those pressures. Um, It also has a component on kind of taking action and standing up for what you believe in. So there is a a section on um, where young people will choose an ad that they think sort of conveys a really helpful or unhelpful body image message 
and they'll either send a letter of, or an email of um, congratulations to the to the media producer to say well done on, on using positive messaging or express concern if it's if it's the opposite but I guess the overarching messages with media smart are that we really want young people to to consider what are the things that they place value on in their life there's an underlying message of there's more to life than our appearance of course appearance plays a part in all of our lives but um, the risk with eating disorders is that appearance or body shape or weight comes to be the really central way that people define their self-worth. And so with Media Smart, we're seeking to um, really try to promote other ways of, of valuing ourselves. And so there's a lot of interactive content, a lot of small group work um, and, and working in pairs. And I guess the other thing that's a bit unique about Media Smart is that when I started in the field, there was sort of a trend away from working with young adolescents with um, body image programs. Some of the studies that had been done up until then hadn't really had very positive findings or some have even had evidence of kids getting worse from doing the program, which of course is not what we want. And so Tracy Wade and I believe strongly that a lot of the research hadn't been that thorough up to that point. So we made sure we developed a program that was long enough, that it targeted risk factors, that it was really interactive. And with our evaluation, we made sure that we followed people for a long period afterwards to see if it was really helpful. So our first follow-up of Media Smart was two and a half years long, which is one of the equal longest for a prevention study with body image and eating disorders in schools. And, and we found some really positive effects there. And that, that set the tone for Media Smart research. And over the years since, We've gradually looked at how we can make the program more and more valuable and reach a wider number of people. So um, we have we've made this, the program available for schools to purchase and there's about 45 schools across Australia who have done that so far. And we're really trying to test out um, how can we how can we be sure that A, the program is working and B, that we can reach as many people as possible. And that really takes us into the, um, <clears throat> the research that we've been conducting through the Rotary Fund. And that was, a lot of schools really like the Eight Lesson Media Smart program, but they sometimes found it hard to squeeze in Eight Lessons into their curriculum. And so with the funding that we received from Rotary, we have been conducting a trial to see can a shorter or shorter, sorry, can a shorter version of the program um, actually produce equally good findings as the eight lesson. So that, that research trial has been a, a two lesson version, a four lesson version, and our usual eight lesson version. And we've recently completed collecting all the data for that. We, um, <clears throat> we are just starting to look at the comparisons across those three groups. But I guess some findings that I could really share with you today relate more to the social media angle of that. So would it be helpful if I went into a bit of detail about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, social yep. media is so important at the moment. Like if, uh, so many people are using it. So yeah, it'd be good to know yeah. what, what kind of impact it has. So this was another new part of the, the Rotary um, grant. We, in the past, we'd always just measured what we call shape and weight concern, which is kind of eating disorder thinking but not actual eating disorder behaviours. And the reason we hadn't measured behaviours is that there's a bit of research around that when you give young people information about eating disorder behaviours, you run the risk that they might actually learn about these behaviours and, and start using them yourself or themselves. But there was some research that came out to show that measuring these behaviours was actually not particularly risky to young people. So one of, one of the new angles with um, the Rotary uh, project has been that we've measured disordered eating behaviours and for the first time we've actually measured social media behaviours, which of course in this day and age, if we're doing a program to target media, we have to be looking at social media as well. It's, it's a bit different from when I started this 15 years ago with, with magazines and TV kind of being the main media that we looked at then. And so a study that we've had published already from the Rotary uh, research has been we, we looked at the data from at the start of the research trial before the students received the programs. And what we found was that at the start of the program, or the start of the research, 
we had 45% of boys and 52% of girls who had engaged in at least one disordered eating behavior in the last 12 months. So a disordered eating behavior, what we're talking about here is things like skipping meals to lose weight or fasting or eating very little, um, compulsive exercise. So not just exercise for feeling good and so on, but feeling really driven to exercise in order to control uh, appearance. Um, and then there's sort of additional forms of disordered eating like uh, binge eating, laxative abuse and vomiting. And so those ones are, are less common, but the most common we saw with the girls and the boys was um, it was both sort of really restrictive eating or, or meal skipping and also that compulsive exercise. So I should say that with those stats of 52% of girls and 45% of boys, that's certainly not saying that all of those children or young people have an eating disorder. It's just saying that they have at least been experimenting with some of these behaviors. And it's a marker or an indicator that, um, you know, their, their body image or their appearance is something that they're concerned about. And so the, the other angle there was that we were looking at social media and we found that uh, I think it was about 75% of girls and 69% of boys had at least one social media account with this year seven and year eight sample. We should remember that if we're following the rules with social media, technically you should be 13 and above to use social media. So it means that we've got a high proportion of young people in year seven who are already using it despite being 11 or 12 years old. Um, but <clears throat> I guess there were some concerning findings there like nearly two thirds did not have a parent as a follower on their social media account. Uh, nearly 20% had their account set to public, which might convey its own risks. Um, but the bit that we were particularly looking at in this study was how did social media and disordered eating relate to each other? And what we found was a really quite a strong link between um, having a social media account and having higher levels of disordered eating thinking or behaviors. So the more time girls spent on Snapchat, the higher their level of, of disordered, disordered thinking or behaviors. Um, the more accounts that both girls or boys had, the higher their level of disordered um, thinking or behaviors. And just a range of other indicators there. And this research, it's been published and it actually attracted a lot of media attention. There are about 40 different newspaper stories on this study from around the world. Um, there was it was on uh, TV news here in Adelaide and around Australia. Uh, I did a number of radio interviews about it because it was really the first time that the relationship between disordered eating and social media use had been looked at with such young people. Normally it's just been looked at with adults and also focusing more on, on body image rather than actual disordered eating behaviors. So it attracted a lot of interest. And as we get further into the, um, um, analyses from that, that Rotary School project, we'll also be able to look at if there is a longitudinal relationship. And that means in that study, we follow people over 12 months and we want to see if they started using social media around the start of that study, does their risk of disordered eating grow as the study goes on um, related to their social media use? So I really think we're, we're still going to get a number of quite exciting and um, um, very interesting uh, publications out of that study and likely to attract further attention to it. Yeah, so it yeah. really has been incredibly helpful to have the funding for that trial. Yeah, well, that, that's good. I mean, it sounds like it really was the first of its kind and, and you know, it was, yeah, such such a, a big finding out there and it's so relevant to so many people. So, yeah, it's good that yeah. you found that and, and that more can be found, like more research can, can continue on from that as well. So, yeah, uh, we, we have actually, um, as a result of doing this research, we've, we've been approached by um, a, uh, a district in, in southern New Zealand looking to, to test out how, how the Media Smart program might be able to help with social media in their area and also taking another step forward with um, testing out how it goes when it's delivered by teachers rather than in our trial it was delivered by trainee psychologists and that's it's a bit of a trade-off there because in theory psychologists or trainee psychologists would know more about body image and eating disorders than teachers but teachers um, of course know more about managing classrooms of children and um, the best ways to sort of have 
um, curriculum completed and so on. So, so we're, we're already having some further avenues there, both in New Zealand and a school here locally has asked if they can test out the program with year six students, which will be the youngest we've tested Media Smart with so far, because they have already noticed that um, social media use is much more common, uh, sorry, is common before the, the, the age of year seven. So we need to be intervening earlier there. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's so important that, yeah, that we now know that and we know that, yeah, this is where we should intervene. And, yeah, so hopefully that, you know, those findings help a lot of people, you know, going forward. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess as well, um, you know, you were testing the program, um, you know, for two sessions um, as opposed to six or eight sessions. I guess mm. um, <clears throat> when do you think those findings will start to come out or, or do you already know something but you can't quite talk about it yet? Or <laughs> It's very likely that those findings will be um, out, I would think, within the next few months, where I actually don't know something yet. Uh, <laughs> like, if you're wondering if I'm just keeping the results close to my chest, it's, it's more that, um, and we'll probably mention the other trial in a moment, the, my research time at the moment has been really dedicated to, to launching another trial that we're partnering up um, with Rotary on. And so... The moment that is up and running, the other school stuff, I'll be able to finish analysing and, and share that. And I will certainly, um, you know, share with you directly, Jessica, and be happy to, to talk again, if you wish, on, a, on another podcast down the track. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. And um, also at the moment, you're working on that other grant with um, Professor Tracy Wade, um, I guess, mm -hmm. has anything come out of that so far? I know it's fairly early, but... Um, yeah, so that grant, what we're looking at there is um, with all the positive findings for the Media Smart School program, we noticed that in Australia, there wasn't much um, being offered to late adolescent um, age people or even young adults. And in the eating disorder research, we know that times of transition are a time of increased risk for an eating disorder. So finishing school and going into university is obviously a major change for young people or going into adult life in general. And so um, a number of years ago, we developed an online version of Media Smart and it was originally for 18 to 25 year old women only. Um, and we were really, unlike the school program, in the online program, we were looking at um, trying to help people who might already be in the early stages of an eating disorder, trying to prevent it from becoming a full full-blown uh, clinical problem. And we compared it to an established program from the US and we actually had very positive findings for, for our new Media Smart program at that time. So we put together an application um, to Rotary and to, to advance that program. And, and what the new, um, new components of there were that we expanded the age range. So we've gone from just 18 to 25 year old women to now 13 to 25 year old people of any gender. And um, the, the primary aim though, is to test out in the original version, Media Smart was released one module per week. So we'll have that group again, but we wanna test out, do we have better completion rates of the program or even more positive findings if users can complete the program at their own rate? So. Basically, we're going to have the standard weekly version and the flexible sort of do it at your own rate version and compare it to a control group. Um, because really, most young people like to be able to use an app or media in the way that suits them. It's, it's a little bit outdated now to say, OK, here's your weekly module that you can work through. Um, so we're very excited about that. But in putting it all together, um, my colleagues and I have also updated the program a bit in in light of the social media findings that we were just talking about before. So we're really trying to make the program even more social media heavy, if you like, to really make sure we're addressing the media most relevant to young people. That program was close to launching um, around the time of COVID starting, and then there were a few delays there. Basically, we are in the very final stages of testing that now, and it will be launched very likely within the next few weeks. Um, when it does launch, we will be sort of uh, really trying to promote that widely because it will be open to any uh, Australian or New Zealand citizen aged between 13 and 25 years of any gender who wishes to improve their body image. And this is actually a really positive time to be doing research like this 
where it is online. You don't have to, you know, be accessing um, face-to-face services. It's difficult to access face-to-face services in this climate. So, but even even outside of COVID times, um, many young people do not feel comfortable seeking help for body image concerns or eating disorder symptoms. So we found that um, with our first trial, only 15% of people had ever sought help from a GP or a psychologist, mental health professional, even though the vast majority of participants really did need help um, with their mental health and with their their eating behaviours. So we're very excited to have that launched. It's a pity that there has been a little bit of a delay, but we are very optimistic about our rate of recruitment and we're looking for over a thousand people to participate in that. And um, yeah, we as I mentioned earlier, we had a lot of media about the social media paper in December last year. And a lot of those contacts are also looking for an update once this launches. So we'll probably have another further round of media shortly on this. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, let us know once it's launched and we'll share it in our networks as well. And yeah, hopefully we can yeah get all those participants. <laughs> that sounds excellent. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, it sounds like you're doing some really important work um, on, on eating disorders and, and for youth especially. And I know that our Rotarians really like to see where their funding has gone. And it's such a competitive industry as well, um, you know, to receive funding in this area. I guess, um, could you maybe tell us a bit about how this funding may have made a difference um, to your research career? This funding, uh, particularly having received funding for two projects, has made an enormous difference. I am extremely grateful for the the support. With with my work, I value greatly um, applied or pragmatic research. So I work in a clinic, as I mentioned. I want the research I do to have a really real-world impact. And um, both the school program and the online program, the primary purposes of the research are A, to test out that they actually work and are effective and helpful, and then B, to make sure that they are disseminated as widely as possible to benefit young people and to prevent um, really full-blown eating disorders from developing. So I I really appreciate that Rotary seems to be attracted to research that is is really seeking to have a real-world impact, and this work would not have been possible without that funding. So, again, extremely grateful. Um, and I also see that as a real responsibility to make sure that we conduct the research to a high standard and, um, you know, communicate it widely because I, I think that that's a component of research that often does go lacking sometimes that scientists can, can really get their publications done and so on. But it's really important that we're looking at the real world benefit of our research and, and communicating that widely and making sure that, um, the people who need what we've developed can receive it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really appreciate you um, joining us on our podcast today, Simon. I guess, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we wrap up today? No, no. Well, not really, other than just to, again, express my my appreciation to you and the whole Rotary team, Jessica. Really, um, it's a great help. Um, I will certainly be keeping in touch about our research as it develops and And if your audience does have an interest in hearing more about the actual findings, then of course, I'll be happy, happy to share that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again. That was the 16th episode of our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid. It's always so inspiring to hear what researchers in Australia are doing to make a difference to mental health and how they are helping us on our mission to lift the lid on mental illness. If you can, please continue supporting important mental health research like Dr. Wilsch's by donating on the Australian Rotary Health website. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time.